Howdy, everybody. Welcome to a brand new Road Reflections. Uh, holiday week. Holiday week. So, uh, I'm trying to do a couple of these, um, road reflection things. I should, we're going to start with our usual. We're going to start with a check-in. We're going to do a couple of quick announcements up at the top and then dive right into it because I do have, uh, a bit of a packed show. Uh, so I'm going to try to get through, uh, all this, all the topics that I want to hit today. So, um... Let's start with a little bit of the check-in here. Uh, I'm okay. I feel like I'm, I'm probably taking things a little too personally, and my anxiety is still uh, a little little higher than it probably needs to be. Part of that it probably comes from the fact that, like, I feel like, you know, oh, man, I disagreed with a friend or, or you know, I had a disagreement about a project or something like that, and I guess it's over, Uh it kind of goes to the fragility of things right now. Oh man, got to do a three-point turn in the parking lot? That's crazy. Um, but I, I do feel like, you know, there, there's a, there is that notion of like, you know, things are, things are so tenuous at all times. And I feel like a lot of things are, and maybe this is just sort of my own weird anxieties but I do feel like things are just wound up that you know at any point they could snap and things go into a powder keg and and that's that that's probably the general kind of air of how things are um in in our society right now with all the things that are going on and I got a disagreement with a friend over Facebook and I got, you know, in, in my head, I'm like, well, there, there goes that, 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 that's over. And I know it's not, I know it's a disagreement. We've had disagreements before and I just kind of explain what, what my perspective and point of view is and why I put that up on social media or why I tweeted that or, or whatever, whatever the instance is. Um, I like, it's fine, you know? And at the end of the day, if we can't reconcile it or, or we can't come to some kind of understanding, we can just say, all right, this is a point that we disagree on as friends, and that's fine. Uh, it's, it's not the be-all, be end-all, because you think one of a take I had is, is not great. Um, but, I, you know, I, I generally think I'm, I'm, I'm well, it's, it's a constant, like, I'm working on it kind of thing, and but I'm, I'm far more easily overwhelmed these days. And um, even, I mean, even in the beginning of the pandemic, I wasn't as overwhelmed. And I, and I think that that sort of feeling of being so tightly wound, and, and I'm, I'm probably a lot more tightly wound, uh, is probably contributing to that. So trying to work on that, trying to, you know, relax a little bit for, for what it's worth and, and not, not take everything as... Uh, personally, as um, as I would, this fucking douchebag, uh, at least let me through if you're going to take my lane change there, bro. Come on. Uh, <laughs> sometimes people are just assholes, and uh, it bugs me. Anyway, uh, to jump into some announcements, uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channels, please subscribe to my channels. Uh, however you decide that you want to watch this, if, uh, if you don't like Facebook or YouTube or, or the audio versions of this podcast because you like looking at my bearded mug, uh, you know, uh, go to Rockfin, rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha, uh, post videos and podcasts up every day. And if you're on Rockfin, you, you also now, that is the place where you can get, uh, my podcast taboo table talk as well. It's, it's really becoming the one place where uh, my content is uncensored and you, you pretty much get the entire breadth of uh, all the things that I make. Uh, sign up to my email list. I'm going to be sending out a, um, an email tomorrow, probably, before Thanksgiving. So I might send it out tomorrow night or something along those lines, or tomorrow evening maybe, something along those lines. Uh, but usually they go out on Thursdays. I probably, uh, I'll, I'll miss a week here or there just because of 
stresses or what have yous, but I usually will make it up in the next email with, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. Uh, sustaining members, uh, now is, I, I feel like now is the, the time to become a sustaining member and to join email lists of independent content creators, you know, those not affiliated with large networks or, or, or really mainstream networks. Um, now is the time to kind of jump on board of those email lists and, you know, stay tuned to those because that's how you're going to know when we, when we put stuff out. Um, I will be doing a live stream on Friday, and uh, if you're not subscribed to Tableau Table Talk, there's going to be a special little Thanksgiving edition of Tableau Table, Table Talk, uh, where I'm going to be, I'll be, uh, I'm going to throw up a, a little pleasant surprise. It's not going to be an interview or anything, but it will most definitely be a, uh, a pleasant surprise of sorts. So, um, keep your eyes peeled. I'm also, I'm also, as Hopefully, after the this first round of holiday chicanery um, wraps itself up, uh, I will be able to make a decision as things kind of cool off um, to figure out when I can do uh, those virtual shows again. And I'm probably going to rebrand it a little bit, uh, call them Forkful Lives, uh, you know, because because they do end up being Forkful of Noodles episodes and. Um, go from there. Uh, so, uh, that being said, I think this is the, this is the, the we're going to jump into it. Let's jump into it. Uh, Thanksgiving. It's this Thursday. Thanksgiving is on Thursday. And, um, you know, I, I really feel like throughout this entire pandemic, we should have just canceled all the holidays. We should have said, stay put. You know, have your quarantine and, and stay within your quarantines because every single time we've had a holiday and we've we've let it kind of carry on like normal, like it, they're like we're not in a fucking pandemic. The numbers go up. Um, Easter. After Easter, people attended the people attended Easter service. They decided to go see family during Easter. Uh, numbers went up uh, two weeks later. You know, like a week later, we started finding out more cases were coming up, more deaths came up. Um, over this summer, we had Memorial Day. People wanted to do backyard barbecues. Numbers went up. Uh, people wanted to do Fourth of July. Numbers went up. People couldn't even give a fucking bike rallies in this country, and now they're now they're contract tracing uh, and finding out like how many people these folks at the biker rallies in Sturgis uh, infected when they went home. We have seen holiday after holiday, big event after big event, um, cause these surges. In cases, in deaths of COVID-19. Um, and yet, when it came to the rest of the holidays, uh, the government didn't know how to handle it. I've said this before. We knew that there was going to be a second wave and possibly even a third since July. The WHO came out and said that we're going to see one in October, November. In July, they said this. And yet, uh, the United States government and the United States people, uh, well, I, I, won't, I won't say all people, but a good amount of people decided to carry on as if we weren't in a global pandemic. In May and June, we were seeing countries like Denmark, like Norway. Uh, there were various other European countries um, that were essentially coming out. New Zealand, Australia, um, you know, that, that were coming out of their first wave and were able to resume a 
semblance of normalcy. And what do I mean by a semblance of normalcy? Um, I mean, uh, you know, people were able to go and do some form of gathering. Now, over the summer and into the beginning of fall, America did the same thing, but America was still seeing case after case. Hospitals weren't being overloaded as much as they are now or in the very beginning of this pandemic, but we were still seeing a couple hundred cases a day over the summer, especially surrounding holidays, right? Like, that was the thing that was happening. And yet we couldn't come up with a plan to say, okay, this thing doesn't seem to be going away. The WHO said that there's going to be some shit coming up in October, November. Why don't we make a plan so that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system? A capitalist run insurance based healthcare system that is no longer able to take care of its people. We didn't make a plan for that. We didn't say anything about it. We just kind of pretended like things were going to be normal. And we dropped our guard, the numbers went up, you know, difficult conversations needed to be had because even people that were being responsible started acting in an irresponsible manner. And now here we are, Thanksgiving. We were, uh, you know, gonna see some family and uh, had to cancel. Sister had to cancel. Uh, A lot of people had to cancel their plans. uh, Specifically within the last like three or four weeks. The end of October around Halloween was probably the last time where you could do any kind of gathering. And even Halloween wasn't something we weren't willing to give up. There were still parties happening, costume parties happening. Right, uh, Some people were being responsible. A lot of people weren't. Because it's Halloween. We're not going to... Don't be afraid of the virus, you guys. Both sides are preaching that whole thing. They have different, you know, following statements. For Trump, it's don't be afraid of the virus because... Uh, look at me, I'm rich and I, uh, I got, you know, the top of the line health care. And if you work hard enough, you can earn... Uh, health care and you'll be fine so just work hard don't be afraid of the virus um, to the Democrats it's we got you we're not doing anything but let's just say that we got you let's throw a couple platitudes out there and then we'll say orange man bad but don't be afraid of the virus because the Democrats are here what are the Democrats doing don't worry about that People are still traveling. They, you know, uh, cases are going up, deaths are going up, and people are still traveling. I'm not even here to say please don't, uh, because I know that Americans won't. Because that need for tradition is so vehemently strong in Americans. And and look, I'm, I'm not even saying, like, fuck your family traditions or any of that sort of stuff. I'm just saying this is not the year for it. There were a lot of traditions and norms that a lot of people had to give up, including myself. First of all, I, I like had to completely change the way I approached my career, and then just change my essentially like become go back to where I was five or six years ago in order to make ends meet because I can't be a full-time touring comedian right now. Entertainers all across the country had to give up their livelihood and and to go to something different in order to make sure that, that themselves and their families are taken care of. Venues did the same thing. Small businesses had to adjust and do the same thing. You know, and, and and we can't give up a turkey dinner for one year. You can't do a little virtual hangout. Can't be with your, your housemates or your, you know, your immediate family, your quarantine, 
you have to do a big get together. And as with all of the other holidays, Thanksgiving will cause a spike. They all have. What makes you say that the pattern is now going to change? Because it's Thanksgiving? We are in the midst of uh, wave two, which is hitting us harder than wave one. It didn't have to. We could have put a lot of plans in place. We could have said, hey, we're putting travel advisories starting at the end of October. Please limit your gatherings to under 10 people. Wear a mask. And if you're traveling from state to state, you're going to need to prove that you got a test and it came out negative 72 hours earlier. There has to be a way to check and enforce this stuff. Is that the right thing to do? I'm not sure. A country as authoritarian as America, I don't particularly trust, will do the right thing in terms of morality when it comes to breaching privacy. Just this notion of national security is always turned or th- thrown around, right? That was that was the reason why people gave up their rights in 9/11. After 9/11 happened, national uh, security, and um, you know uh, we we xenophobically attached any attacked anybody that was brown or had a beard um, that didn't speak English. National security. Well, what do you think a ravaging virus is? A voracious, ravaging virus. And someone that is willing to not take the precautions, to not, uh, you know, do the right thing and socially distance and wear a mask and be cautious and limit their exposure to the outdoors and bars and all of these other gatherings that, that we have to limit. I would say that person is probably a threat to national security. And you have a bipartisan support, both Biden and Trump. We will not lock down the country. They both said it. Neither one of them are going to lock down the country. Well, then what do you propose to do? So we'll see what Thanksgiving yields, but I would I would recommend that uh, you know Christmas time. I I also understand the the the, the trouble that bars are having because um, it it does come down to like staffing and how do you uh, how do you take care of some people, how do you make sure that everybody is is paid up and and all that kind of all that kind of stuff. Um, when you have to restaff in the middle, that that does suck. I understand, but and and again, I'm I'm putting that onus on uh, on a governmental level, state or local, or federal. All all three levels kind of drop the ball on that front. Um, they really did, and they let small businesses down yet again in the middle of a pandemic. So I see that I see this stuff like on local news about about you know bars and restaurants and stuff that are like we don't know what to do like we're you know we're staffed to uh, accommodate people because we know they're it, that's one of our busy days but we're going into another stay at home thing and people aren't going to come out and, you know. There is no governmental relief right now. And there doesn't look to be one on the horizon because politicians are too busy performing and thumping their chests against each other. They're rich. They can, they're can. they fine. Nancy Pelosi's fine. Chuck Schumer, Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, they're fine. They have Cadillac health insurances, top-of-the-line fucking doctors to, to rescue them from COVID-19 if they get it. You and your family, uh, I mean, Ameri- there, there's still hundreds of millions of Americans that can't afford health insurance or have health insurance, and it does dick all for them. Maybe Christmas we don't need to celebrate. 
Or if you do celebrate Christmas, celebrate it with people that you live with. Your, or, uh, your, your quarantine. And do something small. And when all of this shit is over, we can go back to, you know, hyper-consumerism. That's what it all boils down to. It boils down to consumerism. They want you to spend your money on some shit. Stimulates that economy. Fucking Sophie's choice at this pan- that this That capitalism has made you choose. Not even this pandemic. This pandemic made it pretty evident that we need more um, social programs and initiatives in place to ensure that we don't have a total collapse of the middle class of, of working class people. Maybe Christmas and New Year's. America will... will We'll do the logical thing and not travel from state to state. Each state having a different guideline for what is and isn't acceptable during a fucking global pandemic. Because freedoms. And you'll stay at home. You'll have a smaller get-together. And just not consume. Okay, uh, let's move on to the second thing that I do want to talk about. I've been talking about what's going on with Iran for for a little bit here, and I'm going to continue to do so. And I do apologize if you're a regular viewer and some of this information is uh, repetitive, but it is important to talk about because, you know, corporate media isn't really talking about it. Uh, So it's up to comedians um, and (laughs) content creators and assholes their cars to fucking... Uh, point point stuff like this out. Counterpunch has been talking a lot about this. Um, there's lots of great journalistic outlets that have been covering Iran. The Gray Zone was was big on covering what was going on with Iran. So uh, recently, uh, Mike Pompeo has, you know, the, the Trump administration has basically decided that they're going to put new sanctions on Iran every single week till Trump is out of office. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're looking at what, 12 to 15 new sanctions, uh, put on Iran, um, during a pandemic that is preventing them from getting, uh, medical supplies and really putting their full weight behind social programs to help their people. Uh, and regardless of what you think about Iran, um, what America is doing with economic sanctions, this economic warfare, um, is shameful and uh, should be, um, you know, protested and uh, declined by the American people. Because I will say this, Pompeo called for snapback actions. That's what he calls it, snapback actions, uh, in saying that we need to put more economic sanctions on Iran uh, because... You know, they're 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 what what did John Bolton say? Troika of tyranny. Uh, you know, and they're, they're he said this at the UN Security Council, and he was expecting all of these European countries to come out and basically be like, "Yes, fuck Iran, everybody, let's let's join together in the genocide of another country. Let's use economic warfare to gaslight the American people into approving another war. Uh, By saying, oh, look, these guys are so terrible. Look at the condition that these people's lives are in because this government is so evil. When in reality, it's not their government that's evil. It's American, the American government that's evil that puts economic sanctions that doesn't allow them to get the relief and the aid and the funds that they actually need to take care of their own. So really, who's the bad guy in this situation? Especially during a global pandemic. (laughs) So, uh, you know, Pompeo got some backlash for saying these economic sanctions are snapback. European countries are like, no, we don't want to fucking do that. Are you crazy? Uh, And Pompeo was like, have you met me? Um, I'm America's deadliest care bear, bro. So, 
there's basically no country there right now that wants to participate in economic sanctions except for America. We love it. We put, I mean, we put economic sanctions on Venezuela. Although Venezuela uh, is is still doing better than America despite American economic sanctions. And what this goes back to is that Iran nuclear deal, right? So in 2015, you had uh, the U.S. in conjunction with the EU, Russia, and China, France, Britain, uh, they all uh, basically used economic sanctions as a leverage to get Iran to sign this nuclear deal saying that they won't have uh, they, they won't develop a nuclear program, that, they, that they, they're basically going to curtail the amount of uh, enriched uranium that they can have within their country, uh, stockpile within their country, and, you know, Iran was going to abide by this. And in, in return for doing, doing that, um, Iran would then get, uh, get the funds that they, that, that they rightfully deserved it too. So, so essentially the economic sanctions were put on as like a hostage negotiation. That's what the that's what the nuclear deal was. It was a hostage negotiation. And again, I want I want to know that you know Russia and China, two countries that are now seen as as our, our our mortal enemies, were part of this deal. Now, the the reason why these funds were so important was because the IMF and uh, uh, you know a lot of the monetary systems. Um, the, the central currency that they use is the American dollar. On an international level, that's the, the, the American dollar is the central currency that is used, which means um, when it comes to economic sanctions, uh, you know, America can dictate what goes and what doesn't. So part of the reason why I think Trump wanted to pull out of um, the, this Iran nuclear deal uh, was so that you, we could impose more sanctions on them, you know, um, because w- without the deal, then, you know, what, what reasoning do they have to continue putting economic sanctions on Iran? Uh, and, and part of that was also to goat Iran into a physical combat, into an actual war, right, into a hot war with Iran. That was under the Trump administration because you have people like John Bolton, Pompeo, um, uh, John Kelly. These are all these are all people that that want that hot war. That that think that war is good for the economy and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and we saw in last July, it was basically the uh, uh, like this fake reason to try to go. Like a, a U.S. drone was was spotted in Iranian waters, and like you know, it was just another. They were just trying to make another Vietnam happen. And if we go to war with Iran, like, that's going to be catastrophic. It's not going to be like Iraq or Afghanistan. Then you had the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani, who was on a peace mission in Iraq. Um, and uh, his, he was killed. He was assassinated. Now, this this whole thing where America is telling what other countries, how much nuclear, uh, you know, uh, technology other countries can have, uh, it's kind of bogus because what country in the history of mankind has actually used nuclear weapons? I'll give you a hint. America. In the entire history, since we did, since the nuclear bomb was developed, America used it twice. Twice. So what's this fear? Shouldn't the rest of the world be afraid of America at this point? That America might use nuclear weapons on them, considering that we've already fucking done it? Where are those sanctions <laughs> for for people to people to look at America and go, uh, hey, maybe we should curtail you on your nuclear developments? Seems like you guys are a bit aggro. 
Now, Biden is going to come in and try to re-implement the 2015 uh, Iran nuclear deal, and he claims that he's going to offer a path to diplomacy to Tehran. Uh, and again, the question remains, why is America the arbiter of nuclear weapons? And if you're really going to be this advocate for peace, then why is Joe Biden not talking about global nuclear disarmament? Wouldn't that be the the it, you you really want to show how mu- how different you are from Donald Trump? Then he, here you go. This is a major way you could do it, but Biden won't because Biden's as much of a war hawk in the pockets of uh, war profiteers as as anyone else. Uh, so you know he's going to offer them that and say, well, we'll take off any sort of so. He'll take off the sanctions if they sign on to the deal, right? Um, If they sign on back to the nuclear deal, he'll take off the sanctions that is restricting medical supplies. Again, this caveat that comes into play, right? Instead of being like, you know what? We're in a global pandemic. These people are suffering, much like the people in my own country, and I should do something to help them out. You know what? I'm going to lift the the sanctions that prevents them from getting their necessary funds to run their social programs, uh, and uh, you know the the uh, sanctions on medical supplies, so that they can take care of their people. And then we'll talk about other sanctions. Well, maybe we'll talk about the ballistic sanctions that are on Iran, because um, because of the nuclear deal. Maybe maybe that'll that'll be the caveat instead of uh, you know. Uh, Funding social programs, uh, funding uh, medical supplies. Uh, why is that the caveat? And why is that? Why are we made to think that because Joe Biden is coming in to make this deal that he is a good guy in all of this? He he is still holding the people of Iran hostage in order to get what he wants on a political level. That's not what a good guy does. Now, again, I'm not saying Iran is a perfect country. Iran has committed some human rights violations. They they also support Hamas. Uh, Soleimani's uh, people, I believe, uh, supported Hamas, uh, you know, and um, that that they, America put some sanctions on. But fucking we fund. Again, the United States funds terror groups. We funded the Taliban. We're, we're, we funded both sides in Syria. Wait, you think we're 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 making billions and billions of billions of dollars on on weapons just cuz? No, it's cuz we're selling weapons to both sides. And as far as human rights violation goes, America commits their its own laundry list of human rights violations. Fucking, we have a human rights violation going right now in in terms of extraditing Julian Assange. If you want to criticize other countries about human rights violations, maybe you shouldn't be committing them in your own. The police brutality issue and the complete ignorance of the people as they march on the streets asking to fundamentally change the police system should show you how much we don't care for that shit. Yet, we have politicians that are like, no, 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 let's give them more money. Let's militarize them even more, but train them to be nice about it. Yeah, no, that's still, you're still committing human rights violations. Under Obama, during DAPL, there were human rights violations when the cops used fucking water cannons and sound cannons and beat protesters and journalists. We have people in prison right now uh, at the age of 80 because they were Black Panthers. Because they believed that that they could create a better society outside of government uh, or racist government that doesn't give a shit about black people or brown people. How about that for a human rights violation? We executed Fred Hampton because he was bringing together various different communities. The FBI executed him. The Chicago police executed him, but under you know the FBI was behind that. 
That's a human rights violation. The execution of a, of uh, 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 the leader uh, or one of the leaders of a movement assassinated MLK, assassinated Malcolm X. Do, I mean, how are these not human rights violations? There's millions and millions of people. There's fucking food lines right now. America isn't feeding its people. Nancy Pelosi is worried about whose name is going to be on the fucking check. Who gives a shit? Joe Biden wants them to sign this nuclear deal or else he won't give them aid and medical relief. No, if you want to be a good guy and differentiate yourself from the Trump administration, let that shit go. Remove those sanctions. Economic warfare is still warfare. But we're supposed to look at Joe Biden as a good guy because he wants to have Iran rejoin some fucking nuclear deal where it stifles them. And then people are like, oh, well, this is preemptive measures, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Well, shouldn't they be taking preemptive measures on on, uh, American nuclear development? Considering America is the one that has a uh, predilection to fucking use these weapons? If you want to sit there and be the shining beacon on the hill, then you should live what you preach. You want to talk, Joe Biden and, and the Democrats want to talk about human rights, yet they violate human rights on a daily basis. I just listed all uh, a, a shit ton of them, so don't don't ask me to be like, but how? Like, no, go rewind the fucking video by two minutes, and you'll fucking hear me scream about it. Really, where are the sanctions on America for committing human rights violations against their own people? And I'm not saying punish the people. That's what economic sanctions wind up doing, too, by the way, is they they usually end up punishing the people. What I think we need to do is put economic sanctions uh, on American elites. All the politicians, the hundred millionaires, the fucking CEOs, these jackasses that sit there if people like in fucking Walmart that are the, the Waltons that are like, oh man, we need to, can, can somebody help our employees? Oh, we're going through such a tough time. Oh, you have millions and billions of dollars, you fucking frauds. There's the sanction right there. Half your wealth goes to your, goes to your employees. Half of it. And if you don't, we'll take 90%. And then whatever's left, we'll tax that at another 90%. There's that economic sanction. If you're not going to do good by your employees, boom, that's an economic sanction that we're going to put on you. But instead, who's who? the American people are the ones that have the economic sanction put on them. That's why we're in fucking food lines. That's why a lot of people don't have health care. Hospitals are getting overrun. A lot of people can't afford a $400 emergency. Put the economic sanctions on the fucking elites. And then see how quickly these people change their minds on economic sanctions. This, I mean, this is, Biden is just going to enact more cold wars. That's, that's really what he wants. He wants to put these sanctions on them and put caveats that, you know, essentially, it, like, this deal is not good, good for Iran. 
you're holding their money hostage or holding their the citizens of Iran hostage because you you want to be some fucking political white knight you're not the good guy in this all right uh this is our last story for the day um I gotta take a drink of water after I, I yelled about that. Ugh. Alright. Uh, check this shit out. This is pretty cool. In Philadelphia, 800 nurses, 800 nurses uh, are on strike. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> And uh, why are they on strike? They're on strike because, well, let's we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, they're they're on strike from the St. Mary's Medical Center, uh, which is part of the Trinity Health System. It's the uh, hospital system that they are uh, that are part of there, and um, this is pretty cool actually. I'm I'm very excited about uh, about the fact that this is happening. And here's the thing, guys, not to toot my own horn, um, uh, but uh, I said that this was going to happen in March, that there would come a time where, uh, you know, the, the healthcare workers would just be so fed up with how shittily our government is dealing with this virus and how shittily our government is dealing is is treating them as uh, healthcare employees, um, you know, as essential workers that they will uh, they will strike. So here's what happened with this particular hospital, and I am sure that this is not an isolated incident. Um, with with the with this particular hospital here, I'm sure that it's not right. Uh, they laid off clerical, administrative, and janitorial staff because yeah, that's what you need to do. Uh, integral parts of uh, the way that somebody runs their their business, somebody runs the uh, their workplace during a pandemic. Uh, let's get rid of that essential thing. Let's let's. Let's make sure that there isn't a way for people to check in and get all their information into the hospital system. Let's make sure that we get rid of a way to clean and sanitize, uh, you know, a place where people go to get better from sickness and ailments um, and injuries during a voracious pandemic. Let's just get rid of those people that are going to sanitize all that. And what we will do is we'll put it on the nurses yeah the nurses have to do it right and and that's that's the that's the way that this this happened uh, the the nurses had to take on the burden of you know what what the administrative staff and all of that had to do and and that's on top of you know the duties of fucking being a nurse as it is and that's a that's already a tough job and then on top of that you throw covid and you know you make the job even harder hospitals are overrun with cases there's not enough beds in in ICUs America still hasn't learned its lesson from wave one, where other countries were like, oh, you need to make a fucking specialized area for them. And again, I got, I'll, I'll say it again. We fucking knew wave two was coming. We fucking knew that wave two was coming. So for, for the hospital systems, higher ups at these, you know, places like the Trinity Health System, uh, to not make a specific spot for COVID patients and then ask hospitals to say, well, let's get rid of 
uh, you know, other procedures. So if you have a, con- a heart condition or you need surgery for your stomach or something like that, uh, well, tough luck. Everything is going to go to COVID. You know, do you want COVID or do you, you know, it's like, wh- why are we asked to make these? No other fucking economic system makes you, tr- makes you make these Sophie's choices. They just don't. Because if we ran an economic system out of social responsibility and not profit, this wouldn't be a problem. Uh, this is this is a hundred percent a result of what happens when you have a profit-driven system. So on top of on top of taking over administrative tasks and janitorial tasks, you had these nurses that had to cover for other nurses who ended up with COVID, right? Because that is a high risk. Uh, when you're treating COVID, you can get COVID. Uh, so when those, when those nurses get COVID, uh, they go home and they stay at home. You know, they get paid, paid leave as they should. Unless you're in North Dakota. North Dakota is forcing COVID nurses, COVID positive nurses to treat COVID positive patients because why not? Uh, It's insane. That's how you make things worse. And it's not like St. Mary's can't afford to hire more nurses, right? Like it's, it's not like they're strapped for cash or something because they're not they pulled in 58 million dollars over the in the past three years consistently that's what they profited that's what they profited by the way it's net profit 58 million dollars some years my net profit is $58. So that's an astronomical number to me. And it is a number that I think you could hire some more nurses. You could hire some more administrative staff. We're 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 reaching record unemployment rates. I, I remember reading at the beginning of the pandemic that uh Sweden, when Sweden was giving a shit, um they were uh, hiring, you know, people that worked in airlines. They were hiring people that worked in airlines to do um, administrative and clerical work. And, I mean, which was fucking super cool, which is awesome. I'm glad that they were doing that. And and and, re- and really, it it took the burden off of, you know, an overburdened healthcare system by having people that were completely out of work doing some extra work. They were doing administrative work and sanitizing work. They trained them and got them in there. This was when Sweden was giving a shit. Now, are you telling me that America can't do that? That America can't look at some of these furloughed industries uh, and hire hire them to help the healthcare industry. Additional janitorial staff for decent pay. Additional administrative staff for, for decent pay. The healthcare industry is already overburdened. I'm 5,000 cases a day in Pennsylvania they're seeing. 5,000 cases a day. But yeah, let's keep going and trying to celebrate fucking Thanksgiving. Right now, there are four other hospitals that are part of the union in Philadelphia, the Nurses Union in Philadelphia, uh, that have voted to strike based on the way that they've been treated, based on salary cuts, uh, based on staff cuts, uh, more more pressures and burdens put on these 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 nurses, and this decision does not come lightly. 
you know. There, there are always these anti-strike people that are like, oh, they don't give a shit. They're asking for handouts. No, no, they're asking for, again, basic human rights. Uh, which are being violated. With staff cuts, with not hiring additional help, not paying them properly salary cuts, putting them in an extremely dangerous situation, sometimes not giving them the equipment that they need, not sectioning off a particular part of the hospital to deal specifically with COVID-19 patients, knowing the fact that you were going to have a wave two with millions and millions and millions of people that would get the disease. (coughs) negligence you know it's it's not it's not a selfish act it's actually striking is um something for the betterment of not just the working class not just for these nurses but for their patients Right? I mean, uh, more nurses means that the, the current staff has to work less hours. Uh, not getting their salary cut means that they're, they're going to be, they can take care of themselves. They're well taken care of. Um, you know, so they don't have to work 12 or 16 hour shifts um, and make mistakes. Uh, they can make medication errors, they can be sleep deprived. And, uh, and, and and make, you know, um, checkup errors. They can get files mixed up. Uh, a, a litany of things can go wrong because there isn't enough nurses in the hospital to, do, to, to, to check on everything. There's no rotating staff. That's the preference of a fucking profit-driven capitalist healthcare system all the money is flowing upward so striking to get better pay to hire more people to be in a better work environment means that the patients will be will be cared for better it's just I mean it's simple logic And again, under the greatest healthcare system of all time, we're, our hospitals are still overrun. Our hospitals are overrun because we're a capitalist, pro uh, fucking, pro profit economic system, you know, that we, I mean, we only give a shit about, we only give a shit about the money. This this is a situation where that is not important. I think the people up at the top, you know, Trinity Healthcare System or whatever, or any of these larger healthcare systems that own a hundred some odd hospitals across a bunch of states, uh, should eat it. Should just fucking swallow up a big loss for the year. That's what they should have done, and they should have been like, yeah, you know what? Anybody that comes into our hospital with with this disease, and we need to fucking get them treated. Uh, don't worry about it. You're not going to get a bill from us. We're going to bill the government for it. And if the government's not going to give people health care, then the hospitals themselves will bill the government. But they didn't. What really sucks about the disease, too, is once you get it, not only will will you probably have a bunch of medical debt, that none of the corporate mainstream stories talk about when they talk to survivors of COVID-19. They never ask them about the medical debt that they're in. Not only do you get the medical debt, but you also get permanent damage to your heart, to your lungs, to your, your, your blood flow, blood pressure causes, I mean, almost irreparable damage to your body when you get this thing. So it's like a twofer. You get this twofer of fucking 
you know, you, you get this economic scar and then you get this medical scar. And yet, within this thing, we still can't figure it out. We had all the opportunity in the world to sit there and be like, how do we fucking back up our, our, our nurses and doctors for wave two? All the time. Just like with education, we had all the fucking time in the world to figure out how to put kids to school safely. Now, teachers did. I talked to some teachers that, you know, took the... And some nurses might have taken some precautions, but... Just complete negligence. Ignorance. In the part of the American government and the healthcare industry. Complete ignorance and negligence. This was a tough decision, and a lot of the nurses that that are going on strike, uh, and and you know you, we we could see upwards of twenty five hundred nurses in Philadelphia go on strike. It's a large fucking number. Uh, they feel taken advantage of. They know that they're essential workers. They know that they're on the front lines of this battle of the pandemic. The government knows it. The hospital systems knows it. They, every, I mean, everybody fucking knows it. What, what fucking psycho wouldn't look at a nurse and say, yeah, you're on the front lines of this voracious battle? And they're being taken advantage of. Their, their salaries are being cut. They're not, they're not getting the the equipment that they that they need. They're having to take on additional responsibilities that's not part of their job description. They're running out of beds. They're losing patients. And they know that they're in the front lines to help people cope with this disease and what does the system do it takes advantage of them it's going to say we're going to cut your salary anyway what the fuck are you going to do you're going to let your people die and that's the framework that we'll see right if corporate media ever covers this which i doubt that they will because i think a healthcare strike would lead into um, a much bigger and would really push us towards a general strike Um, so I don't think the media will, like corporate mainstream media will cover a story like this. I found this on Left Voice, if you're wondering. Uh, but they'll, but they'll frame it as, well, these nurses just don't care about their patients. They don't care about this virus. When that's the complete opposite. They do care about it. And what they're basically pushing for and advocating for is one better care and treatment of all essential workers right anybody that's considered essential and all all workers should be considered essential considering that's always i mean that's the foundation of this country is is work 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 all right uh, that's that's all any politician talks about is getting america back to work we got to get these people back to work 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 So, it'll, it'll push for a better and safer work environment. It'll push for better worker rights. It'll push for basic human rights at the workplace. That's what it'll really push for. And that is scary to, to, the, to the elites, right? Because that means that they'll lose the power that they have it means that they will lose the 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 money that they have they'll try to demonize the strikers that's usually what they do 
it'll be interesting to see if um, if they do make this a little like if they if this gets violent in any way. Uh, and violence, by the way, is never really instigated by strikers. It's always instigated by uh, the elites and those in power. It's usually who instigates the violence. Um, I'd be curious to see if the, if this prolongs, uh, you know, will we see any kind of state state violence towards striking nurses? Uh, I I would also wager to to bet that there will be a lot more solidarity strikes across the country. Those are some things that usually happen that make the movement a little bit bigger, that that lead us to a, a bigger general strike. And I think because these nurses are essential workers, that there might be some solidarity strikes coming too. But uh, I'm going to keep, you know, I'll keep a close eye. I'll try to keep following up on, on, on this as much as I can. Uh, because like I said, I knew, I knew this was coming. I fucking knew this was coming. I knew eventually nurses couldn't, could take the bullshit that the healthcare industry was throwing at them. I knew that the nurses couldn't take the bullshit that the government was throwing at them. And it's, and things are only getting worse because there, there isn't any sort of economic and public health plan. I mean, we're what, eight, nine months into this thing and people, people couldn't come up with a plan. Don't fall for that propaganda that's going to get thrown at you, though, about these these people not giving a shit. And they're, you know, they don't care about their patients or the virus and all that kind of stuff. Um, that is that is propaganda bullshit. They're doing it so that they can be treated better in the workplace so that they can do they can provide the best level of care for people that have gotten COVID-19 or, or any other disease, really. And this should apply to every job, that you should pay them and treat workers uh, with the dignity that they deserve so that they can do their job to the utmost level and the satisfaction of the, you know, the customers or whoever is involved in that job. It's that notion of the customer is always right. No, sometimes the fucking customer is wrong. Sometimes the customer is insane and they're a Karen and they should be stopped. It that phrase gives pretty much the general public carte blanche to treat workers like shit and for corporations to accept treating workers like shit. It excuses them. Because it's not about the worker. The worker has to give up whatever to be to to help the customer, right? So even if you are somebody that works in an office setting, And you go to a coffee shop and your order comes out slightly wrong for whatever reason. You scream at the person. You berate the person behind. Instead of being like, hey, I'm sorry. I know it's been a long day. My order's wrong. Just want looking to get a cup of coffee, anything we can do, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't happen. It's usually a screaming match, right? That's 70% of the time. That's usually uh, what, what would happen. But that's because the working class is meant to pit against working class because in certain respects the working class themselves are the customers and the customer's always right. That means that you look at the service industry people as an office employee, uh, you look you look down to the service employee people. So so we create that own hierarchy within our within our own society when really the office person and the service industry person should come together uh, and be fighting for the same thing. Shouldn't be taking shit out on each other. I think that's where we're going to come, uh, we're, we're going to close this, this thing off. Um, I have a ton of videos on this channel about strikes, about the labor movement. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you know, uh, there's a playlist available on my YouTube channel. There is a ton of information available on my website, Krish Mohan, ha ha, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A, uh, There'll probably be another video tomorrow. There'll be a live stream on Friday. Um, if you're listening to this on the day that I release it, there will also be a special Taboo Table Talk. We're going to resume uh, the Forkful of Noodles next Monday, uh, the release of Forkful of Noodles. I'm going to figure out when I'm going to try to do those live virtual shows. There, it might only be once or twice a month. 
maximum twice a month, um, depending on the month. Uh, and like I, I mentioned this in a previous video, I don't think I'm going to be getting back on the road until like the fall of next year. Um, you know, and, and that's just the unfortunate reality of it. Uh, in between, I'll probably get a couple of different little performances here and there based on uh, the spread, the cases, the, you know, the death rate. Like, I don't want anybody to come to even a limited edition show where I'm reading notes and shit like that um, and, and not feel safe and get, you know, get sick or anything like that. So, um, yeah, there, there might be some things. But, you know, stay tuned. Follow me on the social media. Make sure you're subscribed to my channels. And if you're sick of Facebook and YouTube suppression, uh, go to rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha or go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com and uh, sign up for my email list and you'll get an email once a week uh, that uh, updates you on all the videos and podcasts that I've released. Any special news that about my chicanery that that you you know uh, uh, that I feel is pertinent, uh, and just be safe. Just be safe out there, um, and we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys.